Day 3, Sunday 13th of July. We're staying at a guest house in Elliot, in the Transkei region of South Africa. It's another early start, but after getting up at 4am yesterday, 7 o'clock feels like a nice lie-in. It's still well below freezing outside, so in order to stay warm, I'm now wearing all my clothes in layers each day. We have a hearty breakfast at the guest house, then pile into the vans and head back to Nodonodo Square to film the second family, the Nyathis. We arrive at the Nyathi home and get a tangible sense of South Africa's missing generation. There are countless children running around the yard making a racket, while an old woman sits quietly outside the house, gazing into the distance. Nasi Nyathi is 15, and along with her brothers and sisters, is an orphan. Her mother died four months ago, leaving five grieving children in the care of their grandmother, Unathi, who was already looking after their twelve cousins. The only source of income for the entire family was Unathi's pension. After her mother died, Nasi initially took care of her siblings, and did all their washing, cooking and cleaning. Things in the house became disorganised. Unathi didn't want Nasi to do the housework, but she's a 65-year-old woman looking after 17 children, and things got too much for her. I was able to get my mother 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 to get after my daughter had passed away, it was a very painful experience for me because now even on my health, I'm not no longer good now. And I've allocated all the responsibilities and the tasks to the eldest child, which is Nasipi, to look after the younger ones. Luckily, help was at hand. Unathi approached Nalita, a child and youth care worker with Isabindi. For the last couple of months, Nalita has been working with Unathi to bring some structure and normality back to the family. There is now a rota, so all the children share the chores. They are back at school and Nalita helps them with homework, as well as keeping the house in order. Granny went to me, since she knows that I'm working with children. Then she, she went to me and I come this home to do some assessment. What, what I found here is that the boys, the bigger boys, were doing nothing, going around. It's only Nasipi who's, who is, was able to do the house chores, everything, in fact, everything for the younger boys and for, for, for Granny. Sometimes Granny was very sick, so it was Nasipi who take care of Granny. But what I did firstly, I talk to the boys, mm. yes, some sort of a, a life space counselling that they also supposed to do something to help Nasipi mm. and we set a routine, we, have, we write each and every one's name to the mm. paper that there are four who are supposed to cook and there are three who are washing dishes, so we, we did the house routines. Mm -hmm. Nalita visited the children's school and arranged for them to return to their classes. Through the Isabindi project, she provided new shoes, school uniforms and food parcels, so the children would have something to eat in the evenings. Nalita also encouraged Nasi to go to the local Isabindi safe park. For Nasi, it's a place where she can get away from her busy family life and be herself. It's a place where she can meet her friends, listen to music and just be 15 again. When we open the safe park, we make sure that there are some child care workers there who supervise each and every child. While the child are playing or while there is a program inside in resource, in resource centre, there is a child care worker there who keep an eye to the young people. And the young people, they, what can I say, they love the safe park mm. and they know the safe park rules. It's safe. They only play there. They don't hurt anyone. They don't shout to anyone. They play. While the film crew are doing interviews inside the house, the rest of us wait outside and try to keep everyone quiet. 
This proves quite a challenge. There are over a dozen small children to manage, along with curious neighbours and a flock of very noisy geese. At one point, I take some of the children down the road and play football and piggyback with them. It's hot work and I get down to a t-shirt for the first time on the trip. My favourite kid is a four-year-old boy in a jumper with a picture of a demented robot on it and the slogan, system overload, he's going out of control. There's always one kid I want to adopt on these kind of trips and this time system overload is definitely the one. He's also a precocious footballer and pulls off shots a boy twice his size would be proud of. After the interviews have finished, we film sequences of Nassie doing her chores in the yard and walking with her sisters down the dusty road to the safe park. Back at the safe park, I take the opportunity to grab Lula Mill, who had been acting as our translator, for a short interview on the camcorder in one of the cabins. Lula Mill has been working for Isabindi for seven years, which he describes as a wonderful experience. Initially, he was a volunteer, but now, thanks to funds from UNICEF, he's in a full-time paid role. We talk about his life, career and aspirations. It turns out that he's also a volleyball coach for some of the children and is enthusiastic about the use of sport for development. After the interview, I take a few minutes to film Lula Mill playing football with some of the boys in the park. As we're loading up the vans to leave, Dozens of children emerge from the safe park to say goodbye. They crowd around for a final photo shoot and I get some amazing shots of a sea of small smiling faces turning orange in the rays of the setting sun. Back in the vans we start the three hour drive to East London. The scenery is stunning so I take a few shots out the window but we're on a very tight schedule and there's no time to stop. From East London, we fly to Durban and check into a proper hotel, all of us looking forward to a good night's sleep. It's late and we're tired, which probably explains how Richard manages to leave his very expensive film camera under a table in reception. Steve takes it up to his room and pretends he hasn't seen it. I'm too soft and I give the game away by telling Richard. He's going frantic and is about to make the hotel management go through the CCTV security tapes with him. Despite my plans for an early night, I end up in the bar with Hilton until past midnight, copying my photos to DVD on his laptop. It's only been two days in the field, but I've already taken over 800 photos. It's hard not to. The scenery is so stunning and the children so excited and photogenic that you can point the camera in virtually any direction and get a great shot. We've got a 6am start tomorrow, which will be our last day. I hope that, like system overload, I can still function. This is Andy Brown, reporting for UNICEF UK.